Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. I'm with the University of Ottawa Laboratory for Paleoclimatology, and I'm continuing in my discussions on the nitty-gritty of methane in the Arctic. Its sources, its sinks, uh, concentration levels, impacts on uh, Arctic amplification, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, this um, image here showed the changes of methane in parts per billion per year um, globally from 2000 to 2014. Um, and this is the equator, this is up to the North Pole and the South Pole. So, what you can see basically from 2007 onwards, the methane levels in the atmosphere have been rising fairly rapidly. Um, there were periods when they were more stable globally. So, we're looking at the methane sinks here. Okay, what removes methane from the atmosphere? So, the hydroxide uh, molecule, OH, reacts with methane, producing water and this radical, methyl, methyl radical CH3. So, this is a dominant removal mechanism for methane from the atmosphere. So, when we're up in the stratosphere, this water produced, um, it, it seeds the stratosphere with water, right? Weather happens in the troposphere, all precipitation happens in the troposphere, the lower atmosphere, lots of water vapor, lots of water molecules in clouds, in ice, etc. But up in the stratosphere, okay, there's very, very little water. So, the water produced from this so, increasing methane levels are leading to increasing water up in the stratosphere that is noticeable in these noctilucent clouds, etc. The methyl radical reacts with oxygen to produce this methyl peroxyl. So, it's the oxidation process um, as well, which is involved here um, with, with methane. So, uh, reaction with OH minus in the troposphere is estimated to remove 440 plus or minus 52 teragrams of methane per year. But this is not the only removal mechanism. Methane's transported into the stratosphere because it's a very light molecule, right? Molecular weight, carbon 12, four hydrogens, that's 16, much lighter than even nitrogen, N2, main component of the atmosphere is a molecular weight of 30. So it's lighter, goes up into the stratosphere, it can react with OH minus, with atomic oxygen, okay? You have ozone, break, you have light coming in, breaking down ozone, for example, producing oxygen, and a, a free atomic oxygen molecule, which can then react with the methane and also atomic chlorine. Each of these reactions, the OH, the atomic oxygen, and the atomic chlorine contributes roughly equally to the stratospheric loss of methane. Okay, this is estimated to be 30 to 40 teragrams of methane per year. Okay, so add that to the 440. Um, now, the methane can also react with chlorine um, in the troposphere, predominantly near the surface over oceans. Okay, there's lots of chlorine. Um, there's chemically active reactive chlorine um, produced in small amounts near the surface of the oceans. And that can remove, that removes about 25 plus or minus 12 teragrams of methane per year. Okay, there's also methane consuming bacteria in dry soils, removing about the same sort of amount, 25 to 40 teragrams. So if you add all of these removal mechanisms, you get a sink of methane of 540 plus or minus 56 teragrams of methane per year. Okay, so these are all chemical reactions. And the rate of these chemical reactions is proportional to the amounts, if you remember your basic chemistry. Um, so if there's more methane in the atmosphere, the loss will be more. Okay, the magnitude of these sinks changes with the concentration. So in terms of, so we look at things in terms of atomic atmospheric lifetimes. Lifetime of methane, it's that concentration the total mass or burden of methane in the atmosphere divided by the loss rate, okay, 
Um, so here we go. We had in 2012 using a global average methane concentration of 1795 ppb. Um, the atmospheric burden is 4932 teragrams. So this is a conversion between ppb and teragrams. Um, and with the sink of 540 plus or minus 56, you get a methane lifetime of 9.1 years plus or minus 0 0.9 years. Okay, so you could also get that from all of the individual processes. So here we have tropospheric OH. So this is a lost process of methane in the atmosphere. The magnitude of the sink, 390 to 490 teragrams per year, the largest. There is the tropospheric chlorine, mostly near the surface of the ocean. There's the uptake in dry soils, which the bacteria then break down the methane. And because it's dry, there's oxygen available, it decomposes the methane. And this is the chemical loss in the stratosphere. Um, and you add all these together and you get this particular range here as the sink. And then you can get lifetimes for each of these sinks. So how, how long does this process take for each of these sinks? And you get these different lifetimes here. Um, okay, and combining the lifetimes, um, you get the, that's where you get the 9.1 basically plus or minus 0.9. Actually, this range is slightly bigger than that. Okay, so this is how long it takes for the methane to come out. And that lifetime, of course, changes slightly with the concentration because the rates of, of the reactions that remove it change. Um, so, so a 1% increase in global average methane concentration results in a 0.25 decrease in the loss rate of methane. Okay, the loss rate is one over the lifetime. Okay, so this is a secondary effect. Um, and, uh, you know, this can, uh, this can change the lifetime. Okay, so we get more like 12 years at some other concentrations. Okay, so... There's also oxygen, there's also ozone involved here, okay? So atmospheric oxidation by OH- in the troposphere is a dominant removal mechanism. So the concentration of OH is therefore the dominant factor controlling the, the removal of methane or the lifetime of methane. The primary source of hydroxyl in, tro in the troposphere results from the photolysis, the absorption of a photon of solar radiation H nu, with sufficient energy to break the molecule of ozone, producing an electronically excited atomic oxygen. So ozone is broken down by sunlight into O2 plus atomic oxygen. The atomic oxygen reacts with um, O2 or nitrogen to give up the extra energy. A small fraction reacts with water to produce the hydroxyl. Okay, so you need the sunlight. So here's the atomic oxygen reacting with water, producing two OH minus, um, two hydroxide radicals. Okay, um, this is highly favored with high levels of incident solar radiation. So the more sunlight is going to favor this, and the higher concentrations of water vapor are going to favor this. So this means the tropical lower troposphere. So the lower troposphere in the tropics near the equator is a globally important region for OH being produced. By the same token, there's going to be much, much less OH up in the Arctic. So you can really, so the lifetime of methane depends a lot on where it's located, the latitude. Obviously, methane, the lifetime is much, much longer in the Arctic, much, much shorter at the equator where there's lots of water vapor, lots of sunlight. Now OH can also be recycled. So um, you have this, uh, so if you have nitrogen monoxide reacting with this, uh, this uh, molecule which is produced as I showed earlier, um, then you get CH2 plus HO2 plus NO2. The NO can react with HO2 now to produce NO2 plus the OH. So the OH will reappear, it recycles. And you can get two of these guys, HO2 reacting to, to get hydrogen peroxide, which is also fairly reactive, but it can last for a matter of days. Um, so it's, and it can be removed by wet or dry deposition. 
Okay, wet is absorbed in rainfall and then falls out of the sky or by dry, the, 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 it just drops down by gravity and then the OH is not recycled. Okay, so you get all these different reactions. You can have the OH reacting with carbon monoxide, producing the CO2 in this guy as well, which can, can then be removed. So there's a lot of chemistry going on here. And uh, this is just showing that the lifetime, if you have a long-lived lifetime, like, like an N2O-like species, it, it lasts for a lifetime of about uh, 131 years. If you reduce emissions 10% and 20%, then the levels don't go up as fast. But for a short-lived molecule like methane, you know, a lifetime of nine years, if you reduce the emissions 10%, you get a quick drop and if 20%, you get very, very rapid drops, okay, in the atmospheric concentrations. So this is why, you know, it's very important to attack methane in terms of reducing global warming on the planet very quickly. Also black carbon. Okay, um, and this is, uh, where does the ozone come from? Um, we know, you know, the ozone layer is crucial. Uh, it's so, methane also plays an important impact through the role it plays in the uh, photochemical production of ozone in the troposphere and lower stratosphere. Okay, you, when you have the sun, um, during sunlit conditions, nitrogen monoxide and nitrogen dioxide can pass through this cycle. So NO reacts with ozone, producing NO2 plus oxygen. The NO2 plus sunlight plus oxygen can produce NO plus ozone. Okay, so you get this sort of situation happening in the presence of, 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 of uh, sunlight. And, you know, you can get ground level ozone being produced is a problem because we, you know, from car combustion and complete combustion, et cetera, you get this NOx and you get organic compound, and then you can get photochemical gen generation of ozone, get large concentration of ozone near the surface, and it can create huge air quality problems, huge br breathing problems, health problems, et cetera. Okay, now how do we, get an idea of how, how do we measure the hydroxyl levels in the atmosphere? The problem is, is it's very highly reactive. It's extremely short lived. The lifetime of OH minus hydroxide, right, which is the main thing re reacting with methane to remove it from the atmosphere, has a lifetime of seconds. So the atmospheric concentration is strongly dependent on local rates of, pr of production and destruction, which are highly variable in space and time. Also sunny areas, high production, you know, if they're clouded or dark areas, low production, okay? Um, the concentration varies by a factor of two between measurements made under a cloud and measurements made beside the cloud, okay, for example. So it's done sort of indirectly. There's this methyl chloroform, MCF. There's no known natural sources. It depletes stratospheric ozone and it was phased out under the Montreal Protocol. So we can use it to estimate the global abundance of OH because the dominant removal mechanism was from MCF reacting with OH. So when we discontinued, so here we discontinued the MCF. This is the, in the Northern Hemisphere and Southern Hemisphere, the amount of levels in parts per trillion. And this shows the decay over time of this molecule and it's due to ozone, due, due to the OH minus rather, the hydroxyl. So you can see how, um, so, so basically you can see how, how uh, you know, it gives you an idea as to indirectly figure out how much OH minus there is in these parts of, of the hemisphere. Okay, so, so, and we know the decay rates and stuff. So what the, but the bottom line is that, uh, um, the bottom line is on the variability of OH, in, interannual variability of OH. Uh, in early estimates, it was about seven to nine percent. Maximum year-to-year -year changes of twenty percent. Okay, and then we can do a different modeling to find out, um, you know, what's going on with OH minus, and we can get long-term changes in in hydroxyl.
okay, which is very important for methane lifetime.